And now, our story continues. It had been several hours since the bus with its handful of passengers had left Elkhorn City tonight. A trip that had been abruptly halted as they were passing a cement plant just a few miles outside of town. The sound of an explosion, a burst of flame, the terrified cry of a woman passenger whose husband was night watchman at the plant. Those things explain the somewhat incongruous group of people who now, several hours later, are assembled in an office of this plant owned by Jonathan Smith, Dr. Paul's father-in-law. The few men who had been working at the plant tonight, the passengers from the bus, sit around helplessly, not talking much. Someone tries the phone again, but it's still dead. The violent sound of the unrelenting storm intrudes itself into the room. Each one has a mental picture of the old bus that started back to town just a little while ago, trying to get to the hospital. Jean Wilkinson, her baby girl in her arms, sits motionless, staring straight ahead. She had wanted to accompany her husband, but Corey Murdoch, the bus driver, had refused to accept the responsibility for anyone else. Because of her baby, she had been prevailed upon to remain behind. Finally, to break the long silence that only adds to the tension, one of the bus passengers says, Well, they ought to be coming to the fort pretty soon. That's where it's flooded so bad, isn't it? Yeah, but Corey will pull it through all right. He's got to. Sure he will, Mrs. Wilkinson. Think so, Hank? I don't know. From what I saw of that old bus... I... But he explained to me. He said because the motor was so high off the ground that he stood a good chance of getting through. Isn't that right? Yeah, sure it's right. But none of the rest of you believe it. I can tell that. Well, I don't think we should kid ourselves, Mrs. Wilkinson. I'm not kidding myself. Listen, I've known Corey since he was a pup. That kid could always make anything run, just so long as it had wheels. He'll make it all right. Well, maybe you're right. Seems to me, though, Dick Haggerty had the right idea that they should have waited here at the plant until the doctor got here. Seems to me Dick should have... Ah, that Dick Haggerty, all of his boss will blow off. All of us trying to boss well, everything. Well, he's a foreman here, and just because you and him quarreled, Joe... All I'm saying is that that girl knew what she was doing. That, that Miss Martin. Yeah, maybe. Maybe? Didn't she know what to do when we came in here and, and you was all standing around? Poor Harry and Billy was lying on the floor? What was Dick Haggerty, the big, important foreman, able to do for them? What would have happened if Miss Martin... Okay, okay, okay. I don't want to pick no argument. If the lady's a friend of yours... A but... friend of mine? <laughs> Are you crazy or something? I never seen her before tonight. But I think she was right when she said we had to get the men to the hospital to Dr. Paul. Well, I will say she acted as if she knew her stuff. Almost as if she was a doctor or something. Who is she anyway, Hank? I don't know. Do you know her, Mrs. Wilkinson? What? I said, is Miss Martin a friend of yours? Oh, no. No, we just got to talking tonight. We were both waiting for the bus. And I was telling her how Harry and me had come to Elkhorn City. How, how good things were turning out for us. Oh, I knew it was too good to last. I knew it was. Hey, now wait. That's no way to talk. But you're all thinking the same thing. You all know Harry's hurt bad. And that other boy, too. Just a minute, Mrs. Hill. You're all thinking they'll never get back to town. They'll be stuck out there on the highway with no way to get help. <laughs> and a few miles away in the bus that makes its way slowly down the highway... Two men, victims of the explosion. Two men lie on improvised stretchers. Wooden planks laid across the backs of the seats. One of the men is unconscious. The eyes of the other have the glazed blank expression of shock. His lips move, but no sound comes. Only an occasional moan betrays a dim awareness of pain. Virginia Martin stands in the aisle, her fingers on the pulse of the older man. Dick Haggerty, the foreman from the plant, watches her for a moment. And then, somewhat sarcastically... That looks pretty professional. Just like in the movies, when some little blonde babe who's never seen a hospital struts around acting like a nurse. You sure put on a good act, miss. Corey. Yes, ma'am. Drive as smoothly as you can, will you? I'm doing my best. Yes, sir. You sure put on a good act. I heard you the first time, and I suggest you stop talking that way. At the moment, the only thing that matters are those two men. Hmm. 
It's a fine time for you to be thinking of them if you ask me. But then uh, you didn't ask me, did you? No, sir, I'm just the foreman. I'm only in charge of these men. No, what I thought was best didn't matter. You decided to make this crazy trip, so here we are. I decided it was the best thing to do. As to whether we attempted it or not, that was left up to Mrs. Wilkins. And she oh, said... Oh, oh, don't pass the buck on to her. She didn't know what she was saying. That girl was out of her head because of Harry. Now, look here. You're just angry because you feel I intruded on your authority. Yeah, Dick, for Pete's sake, stop griping about it, will you? Let's have a little cooperation. Oh, I'm just along for the ride. This isn't my business now. I'm just along as a kind of witness, you might say, to see what happens. But uh, what I'm trying to figure out, miss, is just how you have the nerve to take charge like this. Because I know what I'm doing. But how do you happen to know so much? There are a lot of people in this world who know something about medicine, first aid. Yeah, that's right, but the doc from Carterville knows a bit more. How many times do I have to tell you that it might have been too late by the time that doctor got there? And even so, it would have been necessary to get these men to the hospital. That Paulson boy has third-degree burns, if you know what that means. And as for Harry Wilkins... Yeah, I know. I heard you say something about his skull being fractured. That's what I suspect, yes. How could you tell? Eyes dilated, breathing irregular, bleeding from the ears. Does that satisfy you? Mm, yeah, yeah, I guess it'll have to do for now. Hold that board steady, will you? That'll probably help some. Okay. How you doing, Corey? So far, so good. It's a wonder this kid isn't screaming his head off if he's as bad off as you say he is. Well, fortunately for him, the shock to his nervous system means a temporary refuge from pain. Mm, you sound as if you had an education, like you know what you're doing. What's your business? My business? Yeah, your line of work. Uh, have you a pencil? Sure. May I borrow it? Okay, here. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, do you live in Elkhorn City? No. Uh, where do you live? I was on my way to Chicago. Is that your hometown? No. <laughs> sure tells me a lot. I don't see any need to answer your questions. Mm, no, I guess you're right, but, uh... You may have to answer to someone about tonight. You uh, better remember that. I'll remember it. Now, what about that accident at the plant tonight? Well, uh, what about it? How did it happen? I don't know anything about it. I was at the other end of the building. Boiler blue, that's all I know. What's that you're writing? A report. What kind of report? Why? You sure seem interested in everything. Is there any reason why I shouldn't be? Did you say the boiler exploded? That's right. Huh. That seems rather strange. Look, lady, the boiler blew, and that's all I know. If you don't mind my saying so, you're pretty nosy for someone who don't want to talk about herself. Oh, what's the matter? Well, what do we stop for, Corey? You folks, come up here. We're at the fork. See that ahead? Boy, I'll say. Look at that water. What do you think, Corey? Can you get through? Well, I don't know until until we try it, I guess. Mm -hmm. Never make it. Don't be a dope. It's still not too late. What we ought to do is turn around right now. Probably the doctor's at the plant by this time. No, I don't think so, Dick. He couldn't possibly be. Well, I still say you ought to turn around. You'll never make it. Will you stop saying that? I don't blame you for being worried, miss. I'd be kind of shaky myself if I'd bungled things, if I'd taken the responsibility for the lives of a couple of guys. If you're smart, lady, you'll save yourself a lot of trouble. If anything happens to those two, it won't be easy for you. Corey, what do you think? It's up to you. Whatever you say. Well, I'm thinking of something Jean Wilkinson said. That she and her husband had been happy for the first time since they came to Elkhorn City. If anything should happen to him now... You want I should turn around? No, Corey. Go on. Okay. Look at that. We'll be swimming any minute. Shut up. Well, lady, 
Now what have you got to say for yourself? Oh, pipe down, Dick. The motor will probably start up okay. Just pipe down. Virginia Martin listened with a sinking heart as Corey Murdoch attempted to start the motor. Attempted and failed. It looked to her as if she, too, had failed tonight. Why, she wondered desperately. Why hadn't she kept the promise she'd made to herself months ago? The promise to forget that she'd ever been Alice Logan. To forget that she'd ever been a nurse. 